Hello everyone. Good afternoon and a warm welcome you to, to this webinar. The topic for today's webinar is CNS infections and how syndrome evaluation system that is SES guides precision medicine. Our speaker for today is Dr. B.B. Ravi Kumar. Dr. Ravi Kumar is founder and managing director Exciton Diagnostics Private Limited. He is a veteran in molecular diagnostics of infectious diseases. Medgenome Labs and Exciton Diagnostics have entered into an exclusive partnership for sales and marketing of Exciton's syndrome evaluation system. Before I hand over to Dr. Ravi Kumar, I wanted to inform the audience that if you have any questions or comments, you can type them out in the Q&A or chat window of the Zoom conferencing browser. We will also be sending across the recording of this webinar in case you miss out any points or would like to revisit some portions. So without any further delay, I will now transfer the host to Dr. Ravi Kumar, who will take this webinar forward. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I, yeah, this webinar is in the context of a, um, of a partnership that has come up with Medgenome and Exciton. This partnership is that Medgenome will now bring the entire molecular diagnostics for infections that Exciton has to the market through their sales and marketing efforts. Now, this partnership is based on actually um, a substantial overlap of products, our approach to diagnosis, and also our common, our common vision of what the patient care should be after the diagnosis. So we believe there should be actionable diagnostics and that's how there is a great synergy in our thought process. And as combined, we are now offering the entire range of infections, cancers, and of course, genetic diseases to all of you, the diagnosis of all this together in one platform through MedGenome to you all. Now in this context, actually, the in diagnosis of CNS infections becomes very important because it always remained an intriguing um, dilemma for most of us. Now, without much ado, let me take you through this. Neuroinfections such as meningitis, encephalitis, meningoencephalitis are very important basically because they cause a lot of mortality, a lot of morbidity in the form of the suffering that the patient undergoes when he is admitted in the hospital. And even worse is sequelae that is permanent uh, damage to the body that occurs after the infection. Now, because of this, there are two stakes for each diagnostic, speed of diagnosis and ac accuracy. Now, if you really look at it, the, the magnitude of the problem is very high. Meningitis, about 2.8 million cases occurred globally in 2016. Out of that, half a million, that is 5 lakh cases, occurred in India in 2016. Out of the 12% mortality, 63,000 people died. This is the Lancet report. And in, there are countries where this mortality went up from our 12% to 16 to 32%. And, but what is worse is about 11 to 19% of the people who survive suffer from permanent damages to their nervous system. And next problem is encephalitis. We believe that we see about 300,000 cases annually in this country of encephalitis. And that has the same mortality and morbidity rates. Now, if this is the case, currently in our general practice, what happens is a patient comes with fever, maybe he has some systemic infection, cough. And so he goes to a, a physician, takes antibiotics. Then about fourth or fifth day, there'll be fever, seizures, um, that is fits or altered sensorium. And then the patient is taken to a neurologist, which is many of you, and then you are then doing a CSF to ask, is it actually an infection or not? And then you find lymphocytosis. Then you ask question, is this really viral to start with, or it is partially treated bacterial meningitis, now showing lymphocytosis? So the question remains, and that question is actually causes us to prescribe a cyclovir for HSV and the related viruses, plus 
at least two IV antibiotics simultaneously. This has been the scenario. Now, because let's understand what is the CSS cytology telling us in case of infections. Now, there has been a lot of literature showing us that the CSF analysis, especially cytology, does not throw much light onto the nature of the illness at all, except in cases which have never been treated and we don't get very easily in tertiary care hospitals or our secondary care hospitals, antibiotic naive as well as physician naive cases. And that's our problem. Now, diagnostic tests available for actually infection diagnosis are not only CSF smear, gram stain India ink, CSF cultures for bacteria and fungi, the whole lot of antigen detection tests for both cryptococcal and pneumococcal antigens. These days, there is an ESAT 6 for mycobacterium tuberculosis is coming up, galactomannan and beta D glucon tests are coming up for fungi. Now, the whole lot of IgM capture ELISAs for Japanese encephalitis, dengue, West Nile, chikungunya, HSV1 and 2, cytomegalovirus, chandipura, and toxoplasmosis. But, and then we have virus cultures for enteroviruses, though they are not being done routinely anywhere. And we have a whole lot of PCR tests for HSV, VZV, enteroviruses, mycobacterium tuberculosis, cytomegalovirus, HHV6JC, toxoplasma, pneumococcus, meningococcus, and H-influenza. These three, last three, which cause generally uh, the bacterial meningitis in children, are uh, these three tests were developed by CDC Atlanta and given to many labs. Now, what we are talking about is, these are called disease-based diagnostic. We actually look sequentially for one agent after the other. Let's say somebody comes with fits, is it HSV? First, you ask that question. Then you say, is it TB? Because that's very common in this country. Then you say, maybe it is Japanese encephalitis. You test for that. And then you might, maybe it's a season for enteroviruses. So you will test for that and so on and so forth. N number of tests have to be done. But what we are talking about is a different approach, a syndrome-based approach in which we are looking for simultaneously for all the pathogens that could cause that disease in that particular geographic area. We are talking about in India in this case. So you say, now I will test for A, B, C to N, all of them together. Now, that is what we are talking about. Now, if such a syndromic diagnostic is available, it is not only identifies pathogens in certain specific cases, it's also important that it can rule out all infections. There is something called diagnostic fatigue that sets in when you are actually testing one after the other, all the agents. You can test for 10 agents, that means it's 10 different tests. And a lot of CSF is required for that. As a result, what happens is, in cases where you want to rule out, there is the ruling out becomes a very difficult task and a challenging task for the physician who is treating. So when, when you want to specifically identify the pathogen in encephalitis, chronic meningitis, acute meningitis, of course, dilemma, which is what we talked about, dilemma between aseptic and partially treated pyogenic meningitis, granulomas, ring enhancing lesions, all these are meant to give you a pathogen and you're looking for them. But equally, there are vasculitis, there are autoimmune encephalitis suspected, encephalopathy, maybe caused by sepsis or metabolic encephalopathy, post-immunization encephalitis or encephalomyelitis or demyelinating diseases, white matter lesions seen on MRI, all these require you to rule out that there is no infection. So this is the syndromic diagnosis allows you to even rule out. That is the point I wanted to tell you here. Now, the solution that we at Exciton Diagnostics invented is what is called syndrome evaluation system. The platform is a multiplex PCR based platform, which looks for anywhere from 11 pathogens to 32 pathogens in a single sample in a single test. Let me repeat it. Anywhere from 11 pathogens to 32 pathogens in a single test in a single sample clinical specimen. And you don't require much of specimen. One ml of CSF is plenty for this kind of diagnosis. So this is called LM. That's why you, what is it even when you ask, you say it is molecular diagnostic method that to detect pathogens in critical infections, mainly meningitis, encephalitis, of course, it is for many other 
critical infections which come in systemic uh, manifestations. Now, what does it do? It definitely reduces mortality. It makes diagnosis much faster. It detects four times more than all the conventional tests put together, facilitates targeted therapy, and reduces antimicrobials by 50%, reduces cost of treatment. And we have even evidence that reduces sequelae in the CNS infections. We'll examine all that. Now, if you look at the technology, what we do is we extract DNA and RNA from the CSF, one ML of CSF sample, and then do a, a multiplex amplification of for all the pathogens that we are looking for. If there are 11 pathogens, we are nearly looking for about 18 to 19 different genes of these 11 pathogens together. Now, once they are amplified, the question is what got amplified? And that we, uh, we detect by a process called hybridization. That means once you amplified by PCR, you produced a double-stranded DNA, you denature, that means you separate both the strands and put them onto a solid surface, which has the signature sequences of the genes that have been amplified in this test, which are fixed onto a solid surface. Now you put on this amplified product, which is now denatured onto that, the strands will go and bind at the appropriate place. And that is converted into a, a signal in a grid that, to identify the pathogens. Now, this is an enzymatic reaction. This is this technology. So it has three steps. We prepare RNA, DNA. Then two is amplification. Third is sequence-specific hybridization. The amplification gives us a tremendous sensitivity. And hybridization gives enormous specificity. How do I mean by that? The, if the signature sequence on the solid surface and this, the, let's say there are 40 nucleotides in the signature sequence fixed onto the solid surface, and incoming product, that amplified product, one, either two nucleotides or one nucleotide is not matching, it won't bind and give you a signal. So it is that specific. Now, another thing that we do is we only look for the pathogenic signatures of the bacteria and fungi and viruses. We don't look for common sequences. The common sequences for all uh, groups of viruses is not what we have taken as an approach. Now, this gives us higher sensitivity. And these are the panels that we developed. Uh, these are further available with um, um, MedGenome, people who meet you on a regular basis, or it can be mailed whenever you want. So we have actually acute encephalitic syndrome where we not only look for bacteria, including mycobacterium tuberculosis, pneumococcus, meningococcus, and hip, we look for cryptococcus, and we look for Japanese encephalitis, dengue, West Nile, entero, viruses, chikungunya, rabies, chandipura, measles, mumps, rubella, Nipah, all these viruses, along with HSV, CMV, VZV, and human herpes virus 6, and John Cunningham virus, and toxoplasma condi. All this in a single sample, in a single test. Similarly, we have a meningitis panel and we have an outbreak related encephalitis panel and of course a sporadic encephalitis panel and antibiotic resistance markers can also be looked in CSF where the bacteria are positive. Now, what is it? We have done an extensive laboratory and clinical validation in NIMHANS with Dr. Ravi and Dr. Uh, Professor S.K. Shankar who retired as the director of NIMHANS. Um, and in this study, what we have done is we have, we have studied 418 cases. And this is the algorithm of testing that we actually followed for each sample. We did microscopy, negative samples were taken to antigen detection for biogenic organisms and cryptococci. Those have been taken, then those negatives were taken to um, culture of bacteria and fungi. When the culture failed, we looked for biogenic organisms and mycobacterium tuberculosis in the by PCR. There is an for we attempted antibody detection for toxoplasma, failing which we got PCR. Similarly, we did IgM capture analyses for JE, dengue, West Nile, HSV, chikungunya. The negatives were taken to virus culture for enteroviruses and arboviruses. Then the negatives were taken to 
a real time PCR for rubella, VZV, HSV, CMV, HHV, JEV, Japanese encephalitis virus, enteroviruses, and measles. And we have also attempted rabies antibody detection, failing which we went and did a classical P PCR. Now, this whole battery of 41 tests was what is compared with SES. Now, we have taken 51 samples which are pathology proven. That means these are postmortem proven and these have been obtained by human brain tissue repository at uh, NIMHANS, Dr. Schenker's, um, Schenker's brain bank as they called it. And there we have got 51 samples. These have been uh, well documented, proven cases. Out of that, we detected 48. Three rabies cases we failed. Let me show you the next slide. This is where the, out of the 10 cases of rabies, we detected only seven. You can see that rest of them, we act, rest of them like uh, cryptococcus, TBM, Toxoplasma gondii, HSV, and JC cases, we detected properly. Now the second category of cases are 207 cases of acute encephalitis syndrome suspected cases. Out of them, 77 were positive on the one of the 41 conventional tests, all 77, we recognize them accurately. Now here are the, the list of 77. It contained including chikungunya, measles cases, dengue, entro, uh, enterovirus positives, HSV positives, and Neisseria meningitis, streptococcus pneumoniae, toxoplasma gondii, of course, tuberculosis, uh, tuberculous meningitis cases, and cryptococcus. Now, even interesting, all of them we have recognized. We also recognize some polymicrobials at this stage, like cryptococcus pneumonia and strep pneumonia in, H, in HIV cases, toxoplasma gondii and CMV in HIV cases, toxoplasma and cryptococcus in HIV cases. But in completely immunocompetent young children, we detected Neisseria meningitis and strep pneumonia in four cases. Now, going back to our column, there are 130 cases out of the 207 which were negative on the entire battery of 41 tests. Among them, SES detected 83 cases. And this is the actual advantage of SES. We, we will show you what those cases are. These are the 130 cases. Out of them, these are the positives, HSV, CME, all strep pneumonia, mycobacter and tuberculosis, JC, enteroviruses, chikungunya, haemophilus influenza, Neisseria, and cryptococcus, HHV6, and VZV. Now the question comes up, are they really true positives that the conventional test missed? Or is it that, that they are cases actually we got as false positives? So the answer was by sequencing these uh, CSS samples, um, at that time, we didn't have a tie-up with Medgino. Uh, otherwise, we would have done simple NGS technology through their, through their good offices. But we had to do a very long-winded procedure with, um, uh, in, in collaboration with CCMB Hyderabad, and we have sequenced them and proved that we actually detected the cases. Now, including, even in this, we have detected polymicrobials, mostly in HIV cases, that can be seen here. Now let's go back to the main slide again. There are non-infectious neurological disorders, 90 cases, out of them 22 were tumor cases, out of them 12 people were on, um, were on actually chemotherapy, and those 12 were detected with either CMV or HHV6 or HSV, and except that rest of the cases were negative. Healthy controls, 50 of them. These CSS were taken from women undergoing, um, um, undergoing actually caesarean sections. And with their permission, we have actually with the government of Karnataka helped us obtain their CSS samples when they do an LP at that time. And those CSS were also was, were the 50 normal healthy controls that we have taken, they have come negative. So it is, this has, um, so the, in summary, 
This test at a laboratory level has proved that it is 77% with 37% with an algorithm of 41 tests. Concordant with known positives, concordant with known negatives, additional detection confirmed by sequencing, detection of polymicrobial neuroinfections, which has actually opened up a new, uh, new thought process with us. Now, there had been an additional study done by uh, at um, KG Hospital Coimbatore by TC Ramakrishnan. It is in this case that he divided his cases either for ruling in an infection or ruling out. When he sent 47 cases to rule in, we detected 27 positives. When he sent 23 cases to rule out, we detected one positive. That positive had a bacterium and of course they treated it and further gave. Most important thing is that they stopped acyclovir in 21 cases and all those patients have done exceedingly well. And here you can see the also rank order. We got streptococcus pneumonia and HSV as the top two organisms that we got. Now, they also then the gram staining, AFB staining, CSF cultures, but none came positive. 28 were positive in ACS, three in gram staining, only one could be confirmed later on by, um, I mean, one concurred with us, the other two actually <clears throat> turned out to be negatives, which were falsely seen as something positive in a gram stain. Now, we have also done a study mainly on rule out possibilities. What is the ability of SES to rule out confidently cases? And this was done with MS Ramaya um, uh, in, in Institute, I mean, Medical College, where the neurology department headed by Dr. Srinivasa has done this, where we got 28 positives and 84 negatives among the uh, 112, 102 cases that came. Um, 112 cases that came, sorry. And here, the profile was slightly different. Mycobacter and tuberculosis and streptococcus pneumonia, they formed larger cases. But the most important thing here is that they followed disability of these patients who were, they discontinued antibiotics and gave them immunosuppressants when they suspected um, autoimmune encephalitis or they have given antibiotics and the appropriate drugs when we said there is, a, there is an organism and they followed up and they felt uh, the disability is, is, was very low in, in, in this particular study. That is the effect that I was talking about. Now, many of you would ask, I would I'd like to, before I take you to a discussion, I would like to tell you that I know that you will ask, how does it benefit my patient? It will allow you to switch to targeted therapy within 24 hours of admission into your ward. And of course, the reduction in number of antibiotics, reduction in mortality, reduction in morbidity, reduction, most important, hospital stay. And once hospital stay reduces, reduction in healthcare associated infections and overall reduction of cost, treat, cost of treatment occurs. Now, what we recommend is a diagnostic algorithm <clears throat> like this. In which case, when there is a fresh case, which is antibiotic name, within seven days, neutrophils are high, please ask for meningitis, lymphocytes are high, it's RNA viral panel or meningoencephalitis panel, depending on what you intend to do, or you can do fresh AES completely. Now, treated elsewhere for less than five days, combined picture of meningitis, encephalitis, then you need to do pan-CNS is the major thing and you still suspect RNA viruses, then RNA viral panel is separate. Now, somebody is suspected of sepsis, so there is meningism or encephalopathy, you need to send both pan-CNS as well as sepsis to rule out whether you need to treat anything in CNS or not. If treated elsewhere for meningitis, and that is still the predominant clinical picture, still meningitis is the best. If rule out fungi, bacteria before start of immunosuppression, please do meningitis not meningoencephalitis panel or sporadic encephalitis panel. That only rules out four bacteria, that is mycobacter and tuberculosis, pneumococcus, hib, and meningococcus. So that is not sufficient. If you want to rule out viral etiology, then you need to do acute encephalitic syndrome. This is our recommendation for use of this test. The interpretation is simple and what you need to do. Well, if SES is positive, 
Detected pathogen already covered by empirical therapy, it provided certainty. Detected pathogen is not covered by empirical therapy, you're going to escalate specifically. Detected pathogen clinically not suspected, escalate again if necessary. Pathogen is not in the list covering 90% of cases or then, or maybe that is kind of pathogens that you're looking at, or it is, you have to think beyond infection. Now, I thought I'll take you through a couple of case studies that would give you an idea of what we have done. This is a case, the NEPA case that was that recently one single index case that came up in Kerala. It is a 23 year old male with fever for eight days, dysarthria and myoclonus. He had MRI showed multiple small infox in the cortex and cerebellum and pontoencephalitis they got. They thought it is due to multiple septic emboli. So echocardiogram was done, normal. Chest X-ray was normal. Then they did a CSF. Then they found 50 cells, increased protein, normal sugar. So then they asked, is it an encephalitis? And sent SES acute encephalitic syndrome panel to exciton. We gave it as Nipah virus positive. Then patient and contacts were isolated. Developed, he developed volatile blood pressure and tachycardia, treated with rebavirin, developed urinary incontinence by day 16, but somehow recovered by day 20, and no other case was seen. So the whole thing is this episode got identified within 36 hours after the patient has reached a healthcare place. And this is unusual in a public health situation. So what we believe is a rapid diagnosis leading to effective public health measures can actually contain an epidemic. The second case study is a 51 year old male, fever, vomiting, headache, one week, meningeal signs present, CSS cells were greater than 400, 70% were lymphocytes, high protein, low sugar. They thought, is it meningitis by TB, tuberculous meningitis? or is it HSV radiated meningitis because of the 400 cells and majority of lymphocytes. And they sent um, SCS pan-CNS. I, I showed you earlier, pan-CNS looks at all DNA viruses and all bacteria and fungi. So everything is treatable under this. But what we got is leptospira. The patient was immediately put on doxycycline. IgMSA for leptospira was subsequently, four days later, was positive. So uh, this is another case, you know, um, it where uh, leading to a targeted therapy, that is the whole aim of all of us looking at CNS infections. I'm sure this, this illustrates that we can do that very well. Sometimes the results are unexpected. This is a 16-year-old female with complaints of fever for 11 days, dizziness and ataxia for a week, urinary incontinence for four days, CSF had 150 cells, all lymphocytes, raised protein, sugar normal, and they did an MRI. It showed hyperintensities in pons, cerebellum, <coughs> and thalamus, sorry. It was diagnosed as rhombencephalitis, and they thought they were looking for viral etiology. They sent the sample to us. They did a second LP on the seventh day, and CSF cells were 70, all lymphocytes, and it was sent for meningoencephalitis, and we got it as mycobacterium tuberculosis. It's not that it is not known that mycobacterium tuberculosis causes um, um, rhombencephalitis. There are reports, but it's something unexpected in a clinical context. And actually what a diagnosis like this provides is a certainty. That certainty is something, let me illustrate this in this case study. It's a 63 year old female came with two episodes of seizure and fever. In fact, she had the fits uh, in her nephew's place. Nephew happens to be a, a very famous neurologist. And then he immediately sent the CSF <laughs> that evening itself. Next day we said it is HSV1 positive, but by then CSF was normal and MRI was normal. The patient was treated with acyclovir, but the patient developed aphasia on fourth day. This raised a question and neurologist was worried that maybe there is something missed out. He did a CSF, again, 400 cells, all lymphocytes, protein 150 milligrams, sugar normal. 
but most important, MRI started revealing temporal lesions. He called me back. I remember we had a, uh, we actually discussed it. I said, on the day one, you got a proof of what this is all about. So why not think about drug-resistant HSV? And Foscarnet was added to therapy, and the patient did well. Patient recovered fully on fifth day. See, this is what happens when you have certainty. Let's say the day one diagnosis is not available that it is HSV. What happens is because you have treated with hesychlover, if the viral titers partially dropped and your test cannot detect, then you are in trouble. So it could be thought maybe this picture is coming up some other virus which is not responding to acyclovir. That's what you would think rather than say, no, 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 this is definitely HSV. I found that. So I need to treat it. So I will add, I will look at it like a drug resistant HSV. That's the um, <clears throat> thing in this. Of course, even negatives are very important. 55 year old female, this is a Coimbatore case presented with fever and convulsions. Patient had a temper, frontotemporal lesion on MRI, but our SES meningoencephalitis is negative. So as indicated clinically, they treated with acyclovir and patient got discharged, got better in discharge. But four months later, patient came back with convulsions and raised intracranial pressure. MRI showed the space occupying lesion this time at the same place where they saw lesions in the last time. So it turned out to be a meningioma. We believe our negatives also lead us to some place where there is a definitive diagnosis. That is important aspect. That's an important aspect of all syndromic diagnosis. If you really do, you looked for everything possible and none of them are there, you can actually look in other directions. Is this really an infection or not? Well, there are many features and benefits and um, uh, we have already in summary what we are saying is when you encounter a neuro infection please opt for this diagnosis i understand it's a great clinical judgment to actually point out is this a neuro infection or not a neuro infection but once it is a neuro infection i think the diagnosis of the bug can be done by this test and there we can partner with you and we can all help you on that. Thank you. Thank you for that insightful talk on CNS infections and how SES guides treatment decision. I now invite questions and comments from the audience. Please use the Q&A and chat windows provided in the Zoom conferencing browser to type out your questions. In the meantime, we have received some questions from doctors in our registration process which I will address to Dr. Ravi Kumar. Dr. Pramila Jacob from Tiruvalla um, asked that, how can you diagnose CNS infection syndromically? Yeah, um, I think the whole talk was about, because there are many organisms causing very same symptoms, whether it is encephalitis or meningitis, you're getting fever, <clears throat> headache, vomiting. Maybe there are convulsions, we see convulsions, and um, altered sensorium in, uh, in streptococcus pneumonia, in tuberculosis, and even in klebsiella pneumonia, uh, <clears throat> meningitis. So uh, not only in HSV, VZV, and CMV, we see even in the bacteria. So once these symptoms are there, um, if you look for all of them, you can be absolutely certain of what, what is there and what is not there. Let's say all these agents came negative, you will, you will conclude. These agents are not there. Now I need to look for something that is not there in this list. So that, uh, that, that only a syndromic uh, diagnostic can do, not anything else. Let's say, um, um, like, let me tell you, when somebody presented with uh, chronic meningitis picture and 300 cells, patient was treated for 45 days with ATT. As the patient did not improve, they sent a sample. We got Staphylococcus aureus. Later on, it found it was found that the patient is suffering from otitis media with Staphylococcus aureus. So that is the advantage of a syndromic diagnosis. I hope that answers that. <laughs> it sure does. Um, Dr. Ravi Ram from Rajmandri, his question is, how often in South India CNS infection, either bacterial or viral, uh, in CSF panels 
come positive and useful in guiding treatment and second question is how important is sample collection technique and timing of collection um, thanks for that now um, this question i will answer in three parts number one we have uh, analyzed about 6000 csr samples that came to us in last four years now these six where we have clinical data in the in our text requisition form doctors have provided the clinical data so some data is available and not complete data whatever data we asked for is available and there are 6000 cases and out of them 4500 are from south india so now coming to your answer when the presentation is meningitis we got 52.8 percent as the detection rate when it is encephalitis as the major picture then we got 33 35 percent so 35.4 percent detection now here is my 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 addition to that most of these cases have come to us after seven days of illness after they have spent substantial time in certain nursing homes and uh, taking various anti-infective agents now in our nimhan study our sensitivity is far higher why was it so because we have taken patients very early during the illness within first three days of actual illness so when they come to you by then they have spent two three days elsewhere if you take a decision on day one your diagnostic rate will actually go up now the next question is the collection of csf we recommend the following though it's not what it is what is uh, classically taught uh, at least when i was working in neurosurgery in cnc or it that was not what way we taught but what we do is if you remove the stillet of lp needle and let the drops be collected into a right in the ward collected into a edta vac container cap the tube again and send it to us that is the best sample if the sample is conducted in a wide mouth container leakage is a possibility number one number two contaminations are a possibility and worst thing is to take the sample to a microbiology lab and transfer it from one container to the other that i think is is totally it gives erratic results it gives a lot of uh, contaminant bacterial um, contaminants which come from the labs and the surfaces of the ICUs so that should be avoided so that I think uh, a good care about that CSF is very important but once or twice you send you actually get your feel of that uh, the next question is from Dr. Sadha Pikram from Bhopal can emergency basis reports be provided for viral markers of encephalitis? Yes. Today, uh, our turnaround time is about 24 to 28 hours from the time uh, we pick up the sample. When we, uh, within Bangalore, it is always in the same day. Morning, they give the sample. By evening, 6, 6.30, they get the results. But when we are transporting the sample away from cities like Bombay, Delhi, and other places we we take this much time we take about 20, 24 hours to 27 hours to give you the result but we can give the result like i just now said uh, within 36 hours of a patient being admitted in Cochin, we gave nipah virus diagnosis so that's the uh, the next question is from dr gayatri, gayatri krishnan from bangalore um, she wants to know the level of accuracy in NGS technology. Yeah, um, I think that's another topic as such. Uh, this is not an NGS technology. Here we are actually specifically amplifying the virulent specific genes. Quite often multiple genes from the same organism to give you certainty. And here the, the sensitivity, um, you know, I have not shown this data to you but sensitivity and specificity as tested in international panels which are done from QCMD. This is Quality Control for Molecular Diagnostics. It is a EU notified body. There we got 100% on all viral markers and um, except HHV6, rest of the markers we got 
100% sensitivity and specificity. HHV6, we got about 90% sensitivity. The next question is from Dr. Archana Kher from Pune. I think we have addressed this, but we can just uh, shortly uh, address the question again. What is the percentage of getting positive results on NGS? Yeah. Uh, it all again, you see, there are two levels of approach in NGS with infectious diseases. If you go uh, directly to the whole genome and do the NGS, uh, your success of finding the bugs is much low unless you amplify for the bugs and then do NGS. So you need to do a, a random amplification and multi, mul multiple fossa in each bacteria or virus and add that to the uh, NGS and sequence it and quite a deep sequencing is required because um, let's understand when we say a HSV is positive, that means we are detecting anywhere from 15 to 35 femtograms of HSV DNA. NGS level is not there yet. So you have to amplify it and then do NGS. The next question is from Dr. Sridhar Joshi from Delhi. Um, he wants to know the role of infectious disease panels in neuroinfections. Yeah, um, I think the case studies have demonstrated mainly uh, four things. The neuro panels allow you to, um, uh, first thing is uh, they will they will give you a targeted therapy. Maybe sometimes you get a something that you're not expecting, then you turn 180 degrees and, uh, and treat that. Sometimes you actually find it negative and with certain certainty and you can actually look for causes other than these bugs or other than even totally infection. Uh, the next question is from Dr. Bharat Asati from Indore. He wants to know the duration of treatment. Well, you, I mean, I, I think uh, we are not um, uh, one. One is we are not on a treatment uh, um, webinar. Two, is I think there are more competent people who can tell you about this in neuro infections. But I can tell you this. SES has also been used to monitor treatment. Let's say HSV, acyclovir was, was given for 15 days and sam second samples were sent to us. Then we looked for only for HSV in that and then showed them that most, by 15th day, most of the HSV is gone. There is no HSV left. Not even as we look for four genes, not even a single gene is present. Uh, so it can be followed up. Um, the second thing is fungal. When we find neurosurgeons after shunts sometimes uh, face a challenge of fungal infections like candida infections in the brain, in those cases, it's very difficult to determine when can you discontinue a treatment. There too, we can find out when we can discontinue treatment. But what should be the treatment uh, period? Well, various textbooks and various experts can give you different opinion. And I believe the, I am not the competent authority to say that. Uh, Dr. Amitabh Pahari from Kolkata has the question, uh, AES diagnosis in children, how SES may help in management? In fact, our AES panel is maximally used in, in children and pediatric neurologists use it maximum. As you can see, the best is if the sample can come before seven days of the illness, then your chances of finding any virus in the CSF is very high. We then can manage that uh, with our AES, SCS AES itself looks for um, 11 different RNA viruses and seven different DNA viruses, which is very good. So that, that, that exhaustively looks at about 18 of them. Uh, Dr. Jayanti M from Pondicherry. Uh, she wants to know what are the genetic biomarkers for evaluating response to treatment in case of CNS infections and what is the current research in this area across the globe and in India? Actually, this is a topic of seminar by itself. And what we are asking is host biomarkers, which will tell us A, uh, the level of illness, B, the uh, changing characteristics of the illness and so on and so forth. There's a lot of research, but um, uh, I know of many systemic infections, a lot of research, a few papers I keep reading now and then on um, genetic markers, which will tell us uh, 
something about CNS infections. But I think um, today's topic, I think this is uh, this is little uh, overwhelming for me to answer that because a I didn't prepare any slide for that. But offhand, I can tell you it's still a, a lot wonderful research ground for a lot of research. There's a lot of scope to develop something in this area. Um, there is a question from Dr. Sheikh from Ahmedabad. Uh, again, it is on treatment of viral well, encephalitis. Well, you know, we don't have many, if it is uh, HSV, you give acyclovir. If it is CMV, you will give valgan cyclovir. VZV again, acyclovir. When HHV6 comes, uh, valgan cyclovir is given for a long period of time. Um, and, and beyond that, RNA viruses, very little treatments, except ribavirin being tried in certain desperate cases. And um, especially Nipah, they tried it in, in the recent case. That's how we know how at that time we all studied a lot on ribavirin. But a lot of trials are going on on ribavirin. There is one condition which is which is highly amenable, but is very rare condition. The influenza A um, related encephalitis. Again, Tamiflu worked very well there. Very few cases in the world reported. I don't think any there are any further questions. So that's about it for the webinar. I'd like to thank Dr. Ravi Kumar for taking time off to talk to us about this important topic. If you have any more questions or comments, please don't hesitate to get in touch with us through our website or our email ID, which is diagnostics at medgenome.com and our toll free number, which is 1-800-1033-691. Just a reminder once again that we will be sending out a recording of the webinar in a few days. So thank you again for registering and attending this webinar and hope that it was beneficial. Thank you again and until next time, goodbye. Thank you.